the important for for um, people working in the street and the first thing. Um, anyway, without further ado, um, I wanted to introduce the, the session and our first speaker is Ben, uh, who is talking about the vision and action from natural behavior. Great one. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, sort of privilege to be speaking amongst this group of speakers. Um, you've been teased about this aspect of Mike's work a few times already, and the stuff that I want to talk about today is Mike's work on human and behaviour. And Mike turned his attention to this question in about 1990, and when he did this, most of the work that was being done on human vision and eye movements was being done using very simplified stimuli like dots and gabors, uh, you know, in, in, on, on blank backgrounds and very simplified responses like pushing buttons. And Mike recognized that if we really want to understand real human behavior, this might not be sufficient. This might not be the way to do it. Because Mike recognized the fact that, you know, eye movements and vision are not there to just passively receive information from the world, but rather they're fundamentally part of this system that is about driving our actions. And in a way, you, you know, perception isn't the goal of the system here. Okay, often the goal of the system is behavior. It's to be able to interact with the environment and move around and carry out our, our behaviors. And, and these two things are intimately linked and uh, you know, interact with each other all the time. And that was the approach that Mike took. So to do this, we want, you know, he wanted to study behavior as it really is. And you've seen already some of these eye trackers that Mike built. Uh, and he did this because at the time when Mike was doing this, there wasn't really an option to buy these things off the shelf like we can now. There were a few commercial systems around, but they weren't that great. And so Mike developed his own and they were great. They were really good. You know, they work very effectively. So this is the only one that you've seen. This is the one uh, that was used for quite a long time in his lab throughout the time that I was there. Um, and, uh, and this system here, um, continued to be, we kept evaluating commercial systems while I was with Mike, and they never, they were never as good as the one that he built. They never worked as well, they were never as accurate. And to be honest, although they're very labor intensive to use the ones that Mike built, um, they're still as good as anything you can buy, and you know, to a certain extent, a little bit better. Um, and they, they typically worked in the same way as we already see, by, by splitting the, the camera image so that we could get an image of the eye and an image of the world in front of your head at the same time. One that was slightly different was the one at the end, which we had to, to come up with a slightly different design when we were doing something with the racing driver because of the worry that the racing driver crashed, something like this would just go straight through their skull. Uh, so we had to fix it on with Velcro and in ways that the, the safety people were happy would, would not kill the driver of the crash. Uh, he didn't crash, thankfully. <laughs> the first iteration involved us screwing it on, which didn't go down well. <laughs> Anyway, this is the kind of data that we got from my, from my system. So you see here the, uh, the eye, which is because of the mirrors, it's upside down, and then the little spot that indicates where, what's being looked at, where the phobia is pointing. Um, to get from the eye tracker to this video, it's a hell of a lot of work, right? Because this involved manually fitting a model to the, uh, to the eye and linking that to the, to the dot on every frame of the video. So this meant that, you know, particularly the early work, work took up an awful lot of time to get going. Uh, and to get a lot of data from. But this is what you see. Uh, and here are, you know, kind of classic things. This is Mike making a cup of tea. Uh, this is someone, I think Mike, but I'm not sure, uh, driving around the pond in, in Falma, which may or may not exist tomorrow. I don't know whether there's now a football stadium there. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then the, the one at the end is a, is a slowed down video of someone playing cricket, um, which is not Mike. Um, and Mike worked on these, and these are, you know, some of his, his most well-known pieces of work, but he, he worked on such a huge variety of real-world tasks. You know, he worked on table tennis, on, on, on musical sight reading, on drawing, on walking, uh, on driving really fast, and, uh, and also uh, a little bit of magic as well. And he did all of these things and uh, was, was looking for both the things that define those individual tasks, but also the common principles. And some of the common principles that Mike identified are now things that are so well established that we almost take them for granted. But we weren't known before, you know, these are real insights from Mike's work. And the first of those that you see as soon as you watch these videos and you've heard about already is just this tight link between vision and action. We spend the vast majority of our time looking at the things that we're interacting with, the things that we need for our current tasks. And, uh, and, and, and Mike and Jenny, when they did the, the team making work, uh, 
they estimated that, that something like only about 5% of the places that we look are not directly relevant to the task that you're engaged in. So we really are very much on task a lot of the time with our eyes. And that's true across all these different tasks. Um, but of course, that's not enough just to say that because you know, a task is a very dynamic thing. And so as we move through a task, the priorities that we have for that task, the things that are relevant and important to us also change. And you can see that in, in, this, uh, uh, in this little excerpt from a, a driving video here. This is Mike driving around in Lewis. And here, uh, this was driving through traffic, quite busy traffic, and occasionally having to stop for traffic lights. And what you can see is that when Mike was driving, yeah. uh, he spends almost all of his time. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's no, okay. <laughs> um, so he spent almost all of his time looking at cars parked to the side of the road, the car in front, or oncoming traffic, as you would hope, right? Um, but as soon as things stop, as soon as there isn't that pressure of potentially crashing and you're waiting at the lights, although lots of the signal around you is the same, lots of the information is just the same. Now, Mike spent almost no time at all looking at any of the traffic and was spending all of his time looking at uh, people on the on the pavements on either side. So it's a very dynamic system. Task relevant changes, so does where we look. Um, but also very important in this is the fact that uh, again, you know, the eye is really actively seeking out information. And in a way, this is the kind of the the, the birth of these ideas of of active vision that we're also familiar with now, is showing that. Mike had a really elegant way of taking a complex behavior and showing and, and, and finding the simple solution. Okay, the, the, the thing that explained all this complex data that we were handling. And what you can see is in his work on driving, that the places that people tend to look are the right places to get the information that we need for the task. So when we're driving ahead, we, we, you know, when we're driving on a straight road, we park our eyes at slightly ahead of the car. And where we do that, Tends, turns out to be the right place to get the information that we need to stay on the road effectively. And he showed that with, uh, with Julia Forward by uh, using a, a very simple kind of uh, driving simulator setup where they just showed little strips, strips of the road. Okay. And so they could selectively show a strip that was either the far distance here, so this little bit here and nothing else, the middle distance, which corresponds to about where people look, or very close to the front of the road. Now, what they found is if you just go the very far distance in the road, then people are quite good at anticipating the curvature of the road and, and anticipating the bends, but they're hopeless at staying in lane. Right? So there's lots of error here. Okay. If you show them just the near part of the road, then there's very little error on lane maintenance. They're quite good at that, but they're pretty hopeless at, at anticipating the upcoming bends. If you give them this bit in the middle, they do pretty well at both. And so where we put our eyes corresponds to the bit of the road that's going to give us the most information for these two competing problems that we have to solve when driving. Uh, similarly, Mike showed famously that you know, as we as we turn into a bend, we look at this tangent point, which is the bit of the, the inside of the bend, the inside of the lane that sticks out most into our visual field. And again, it turns out that that's the bit that we should look at because if you uh, it, well, Mike showed that if you can work out the angle between your current heading and that tangent point. Right? and you also know how far you are from the edge of the lane, then that tells you everything you need to know about how much you should turn the steering wheel in order to get around that bend. Okay? And so by looking at the gaze point and the fact that you're strapped to your chair, so your body orientation is the heading of the car, by then calculating the distance between your gaze angle to the tangent point and your body, then you know exactly what you need to do with the steering wheel to not crash. Okay? Um, Similarly, in cricket, which we've heard about as well already, uh, Mike figured out that, again, you could reduce that, you know, it's a highly complex problem. It's a very difficult thing to solve to get your back to the right place to meet the ball in the, in, in the right place and at the right time to, to make the shot. And so Mike looked at, uh, at how we might be able to calculate that. Okay? And what he showed was that essentially what you need to know, if you're, if you're dealing with a ball that's bouncing, the two key things you need to know are how long it's going to take from the bounce to get to you and how high it's going to be when it gets to you. And what Mike showed is that you can estimate those two, uh, those two things. You can't do it on the fly because it's just too fast, right? So relying on tracking the ball during this period is really not going to work. 
So you have to try and make some predictions and estimates in advance. And what he showed is, again, you can estimate those two quantities if you know the release time, so you know the time it takes to get to the bounce point, and where that bounce point is relative to your, uh, to your head. So how much you have to, how much. And so you can solve this problem by looking at the bounce point. If you look at the bounce point and you know when the ball was delivered, then you can estimate these two other uh, quantities, right? It's not easy because of course, what it does at the bounce is gonna depend on surface properties, but you can learn those mappings and that's what my demonstrates here. You can learn them and they're lawful. And so just by looking at the release point and looking at the bounce point, you can get all the information that you need to know to make this to make the stroke, to make the hit, whatever the right terms. I'm not a cricketer. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so he showed again, you know, again, it's a lovely example of how we can, how we can mathematically show that we're looking at the places where the most information uh, that's available to us is, is actually to be found. Now, all of this illustrates this tight, tight coupling between vision and action, this active information seeking that the, that the visual system is doing. But it's not just about coupling things in space. It's not just about looking at the right places. It's about looking at the right places at the right time. And uh, this is something that emerged from a whole range of different pieces of work that Mike did, but I think very nicely so from the work that, that Mike, uh, Neil and, and Jenny did on, on making cups of tea. And this was really about cataloging a natural behavior, a truly natural behavior. And when they set out on this project, of course, they, they didn't really know necessarily what they were looking for. I think that's true, isn't that? <laughs> Is that an unfair thing to say, I hope? Um, and so they might created these, or, or they created these really lovely um, visualizations of just everything that was going on in the task. So, they, so Mike has these roles somewhere uh, of, of, uh, of long tapestries, essentially, recording exactly what was going on in the videos at every frame as you go through it. And then from looking at these, Mike was able to, to start to see patterns in the data, to start to see the kind of things that, that, that repeated over the course of this uh, making cup of tea. And that's what you see here is the summary of some of these repeating patterns. So we started to look at the relationship between what the body was doing, uh, what the eyes are doing, and what the hands are doing. And when you look at it in those, term, in those terms, and you start grouping those things according to the little actions that go, the component actions that make up the overall task of making cup of tea, then you start to see that they, they have these relationships in time. So the similarly shaded um, bars not only come together, but they seem to come in a consistent order, right? And that's what, what was found. So when you then summarize the timing of these things, of these three different components, uh, across lots of different actions that make up the overall task, Mike was able to show that what we tend to do is we tend to start by orienting our body towards the thing that we're going to interact with, and that begins even before we start looking at it. Then we bring our eyes to bear on it, and then we act upon it. And these things lead each other in, in fairly systematic ways. And a key one here uh, is that vision is, right, is leading the eyes by about half a second. Vision is leading the eyes? Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> vision is leading the hands and the actions by about half a second to a second. Right. And that is a really <laughs> nice observation, and it boils it down to this kind of simple a uh, simple description of a very complex behavior. And that simple description of a very complex behavior has been found in lots of other things that Mike did and that others have done since. Uh, you see this tight coupling in time in driving. So we, we saw this a little while ago. If you plot the gaze angle, so the, uh, and also the steering angle of the driver, you can see that they're very, they're very related to each other, but not perfectly lined up in time. Gaze is slightly ahead of what the steering wheel is going to do. And it turns out, but it's about 0.8 of a second ahead when we're driving around uh, a very uh, windy road. This is in Edinburgh uh, at about 30 miles an hour. And so, you know, vision is leading the action by about uh, 0.8 of a second in this case. We also had the opportunity to do this, as I said already, with a racing driver. And so here, we were just curious to see whether things would be rather different when you're, when you're driving 125 miles an hour instead of 30. Uh, and it turned out that actually, in a lot of ways, things were very similar. In terms of, again, we could see, you know, in this case, we've plotted uh, the, the head angle because a lot of the looking in the racing driver is done by moving the head, not just the eyes. Uh, but if you look at the relationship between the head angle and the car rotation, again, we see very, very similar patterns. And in this case, 
things line up about 0.9 of a second apart, right? So gaze, uh, so 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 head turns are leading turns of the steering wheel wheel by about 0.9 of a second. So despite the fact that people are going so much faster, um, the lead in time is about the same. So this principle of keeping the eyes about about half a second to a second ahead of action seems to be uh, quite common. And it might have also shown it for people walking, uh, playing music, so musical sight reading, um, and, and various other tasks. And, and other people have gone on to show, or have also shown it in a range of other activities. It seems to be one of those principles that underlies a lot of the behavior that we engage in. I think it's still an open question as to why it's in that time scale. Um, we never, you know, I, don't, I don't think we've ever really come to a good answer about what's so important about half a second to a second, but that does seem to underlie a lot of different behavior that's carried out at lots of different paces. Okay. Of course, there are situations where keeping the eye systematically half a second to a second ahead of, of the action is just not possible. We've seen one of those already, but, but basically lots of, the, lots of ball sports have this problem that things are just happening too fast. And in this case, it's not, you know, it's just not possible, but there are still key instances where we get vision ahead of action. The way that we do that is probably slightly different, but what you see here in, in, in people playing table tennis, if you can see the green, you probably can't see the green trace versus the black one, but there are key instances when the ball is about to bounce, where the, where the player is getting ahead, putting their eyes where the ball is going to bounce and waiting for the ball to catch up. It's exactly the same thing that was found in the cricket, uh, and you you saw that you heard that about, about that earlier as well. But what happens is that the the cricketer will the batsman will watch the release point of the ball. They'll keep their eye there for 100 to uh, to 150 milliseconds or so, and then they make a big saccade, a big eye movement down to a location where the ball is going to bounce. And they get there, well, they're getting there, you know, 150 milliseconds or so before. Uh, the ball arrives, and then just waiting for the ball to arrive. And this isn't just a case of I detect motion, so I move my eyes down and wait to see what happens. These are actually predictions about where the ball is going to bounce. Because if you get the ball to be delivered at different lengths, then so the the eye movement adapts. And that's what we see in these plots on the right. So you know, good batsmen uh, will change their initial pads depending on where the ball is going to bounce so they really get to where the ball is going to bounce rather than just somewhere okay so they're making these predictions and, and that seems to be true and others have shown it in other ball sports as well that the key to success in these ball sports is being able to make these predictions at key points and observe what's going on at these key information rich uh, locations in the past we heard already this lovely description that Mike had of the uh, of his third participant, but you can see that this is someone who doesn't adapt their behaviour. So that, this is this is our this is our less good player, um, who, who who just made the same eye movement basically for every pitch of ball. So they weren't able to engage. They got the fact that they have to move their eyes down, but they weren't able to do it in such a, an anticipatory way. To be fair, still hit the ball, which is more than I would have been able to. Still pretty good. Uh, this was my, also my first um, experience of the eye, of actually using the eye tracker was to go along with Mike to one of these recording sessions and just see how it's done. Um, right, so one of the things that came out of all of this work, and particularly out of the tea making work, was another one of Mike's, you know, kind of simple, boil it down to a, a simple principle that explains a lot. And that was this idea that, that uh, that they put forward in the team making work of, the, of this basic unit of action, this basic unit of human behavior called the object related action. And the idea that you can, you can decompose complex tasks into these subunits, these subcomponents that are all about the coordination between vision and action. And so we're using our, our visual system to identify what's out there in the world, to monitor our actions, uh, and to allow us to complete those behaviors. And, and sitting on top of all of that, is what we could call a, a schema system or some kind of a driver, some kind of mechanism for deciding what we need to do next. So this is this is supplying information to these systems in order to tell us, you know, what to look for, where we should find it, and what actions we should perform. With. Okay. And as we go through a task and as we complete our actions, so we can send back information that that unit is complete and select the next thing in the sequence of the task. 
having this scheme of control system, of course, tells us that what's going on is a little bit more than visual. There must be something else there as well that's allowing us to make predictions about where things should be and what we should, what we should seek out. And that component then of, of how memory and representations feed into our everyday behavior is something, is, is an interest that Mike and I shared as well. And it's something that I've been working on a lot since then. But you can see it in various aspects of, of natural behavior. You can see it in, in the work that we did on, on racing driving, because this was one case of driving where I said most things were quite similar. In terms of timing, they were, but actually in terms of where people looked, there were some differences. And the difference was when approaching bends, because on this bend here on the track, people did line up at the tangent point, just like we would have expected. But on pretty much all of the others, they didn't. They looked at other locations and they were very systematic about this. They looked at the same place every time they went around the track, more or less. Uh, but it wasn't lined up necessarily with the tangent point. And in one case, which one is it? This, this one here, you can see it's almost on the opposite side of the road. What that seemed to line up with was their planned route. Okay, so drivers learn, uh, when they know, of course, they learn a racing line. They learn where to drive that is not necessarily, so some corners are clipped and some are swung wide. And what they were looking at was the was that information or that location that's going to guide where they need to go rather than the, than the tangent point. So there's clearly some component of memory there. We also see uh, some component of memory in tasks like tea making. So Mike got really interested at one point in these big eye movements, that we make, these big gaze locations, where we take our eyes from a location to something that's, that we can't even see at the moment. Okay, so frequently when we're doing a task, we'll turn around and look at something behind us. And often that look around is done in a single gaze shift or maybe just two. To, you know, so we're really making very large movements. And Mike became interested in this for two reasons. One was to understand the coordination of all the different motor systems that have to work together to, make, to allow that to happen. And the other was what this told us about the kind of representation and memory that, that, uh, that underlies our behaviors. This was a, a situation where what, what, uh, what Mike needed to do was record all these different types of bodily movement that were going on at once. And, uh, and, and again, in a very typically elegant and, and simple mic way, rather than go out and buy lots of recording equipment, he went and bought uh, a Cindy doll and a Lazy Susan from Woolies um, and mounted this and just simply rotated the, the doll so that it lined up with the orientation of the person in the video. It turned out to the sort of annoyance of the reviewers that this was really effective. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, um, and and from this, okay. So you know, here are some examples here. I'll show you a little video of an example. This is someone who's in a, in a kitchen and they they're making a cup of tea. This is all I can do. Um, it stuck with me. Um, and they go. They're meant to be getting some tea. They've been told to get tea from a little pot that says tea on it. But they annoyingly spotted some tea on the shelf. <laughs> okay. So they, if they actually go and get the wrong tea, then realize that they've done the wrong thing. But what you see here is two examples of initially searching for something, okay, and then going back to the same location. They'll do it for both things. And what I want you to see is that that initial search involves quite a few eye movements. But when they go back again, when they realize they've made the mistake, then they get there almost in one jump. Right. So here they go. They found this tea that I thought I'd hidden. Right. It took a few fixations to find it. Then they spot this one. Which is one of the to use. Now they went back there with just one eye movement to get it back to the right place, and then they do the same thing to get back to the other team. Right? Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that you see here. You know, these are some examples of of, eye, of, of gaze shifts that were in excess of 90 degrees. So they're two locations that you just can't see. Okay. And yet people are bringing their eyes to within about 10 degrees of the intended target and then making their little correction. So this led us to think about what kind of representations might be allowing this to be possible. Um, and we came up with this idea that uh, there's this, you know, that, that while obviously long-term memories of scenes must be in some way allocentric, that what gets us through the environment at any one time, of course, is some egocentric model. And we have this idea that that, that model has to be quite expansive because it has to allow us to look at things that are currently behind us. So it must be something like, you know, a, a 360 degree panorama of the scene. And of course, to be useful, it's going to have to counter rotate as we move our heads. Otherwise, it's not going to tell us anything useful for us to act on. So that was the idea that we had, and we described that. But the question is, can we, can we find any evidence for it? 
Well, Mike already had that, and 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 um, he already had that evidence from, I think, a really elegant. I keep saying elegant about Mike, but I think it does characterise most of what he did. Um, but what Mike did to to show that this is likely to be the case, to show that we're likely to have this kind of rotating model in the brain, is that he took uh, some colleagues. I don't know who took part in this, um, but uh, he took some colleagues and sat them in a, in a chair and spun them around until they were dizzy. And then he stopped them and asked them to, to fixate on a, on a landmark and then close their eyes. And so then they experienced the, the illusory counter rotation, lasts for about 10 seconds or so. And then he asked people to do two things. He asked them to judge how much they thought they'd rotated during that period and then point to where this landmark was that they were looking at. And the correspondence between these two is really strong. And this is exactly what you would predict if there was some, if, if these reports are being made on the basis of some now corrupt, you know, rotating model in the brain. Uh, to, say there's a, to say there's some kind of rotating model of the whole world in the, in the brain is, um, to overstate how detailed that should be. So it doesn't need to be particularly detailed. It just needs to be good enough to let you know where things are that are currently outside your field of view to get you close enough to then find them properly. Right, so that was the idea. Um, so I wanted to finish, I had a whole load more pictures, but everyone's shown them already. So I'm just gonna show you these. <laughs> these are some, that, these are some from, from uh, things that I did with Mike. This is Mike enjoying the Piper at, at my wedding uh, quite some time ago. Um, but Mike had a, a huge impact on me on my life, on the direction that things were going, because um, thanks to Simon, I got in touch with Mike because I really wanted to study uh, insect vision as a, a as, as a PhD student, and so I went to meet Mike. And when I met with Mike, he also showed me not only his his, his fantastic work he was doing on insects, but the stuff he was doing at the time on driving and making cups of tea. And uh, I never admitted it to Mike, but I had absolutely no idea about human animal behavior at the time. Uh, but I just thought it was just it's just so fascinating what he was doing. And he gave me a bunch of papers to read on the train home. And by the time I got home, I kind of decided what I wanted to do. Um, and that was to, to work with Mike. And the beauty of working with Mike was, as we've heard already, his enthusiasm for, for science and his ability to, to put that across in simple terms. I loved the way that he wrote. And it was one of the big reasons that I wanted to work with him. Um, and it's why, at the end of my PhD, I didn't want to leave, and I spent another three years as a postdoc in his lab. Um, but I think he's had a, a huge impact on the community. He's had a huge impact on the way that we all approach science and the way that we interact with each other as well. So, thank you very much. So they're also uh, enthusiastic and incompetent drivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe when you haven't learned to drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how so you know how much of these, you know, what we look at is actually trained when we learn how to drive or what yes. is name? Yes, so Mike Mike the uh, PhD student um Kat Hughes who looked at this. And, uh, and what, what happens is it's increasingly difficult to find people who are really not drivers now because of things like PlayStations. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can find someone who, who hasn't driven, what they tend to do is start by looking at the front of the bonnet, essentially. So they do that bit of the driving simulator that is just the near road, and that's where they look. And they spend all their time concentrating on lane driving and not anticipating the bends. So what happens is over the course of a few lessons, then people shift where they tend to look up to the to the middle distance, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. And then what you're also doing at that point is shifting the time ahead that vision is from action. And this idea that the, 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 the half a second to a second principle that seems to be everywhere, that is something in itself that seems to be, that you seem to need to learn because there was a, a nice experiment by Randy Flanagan's group, I think, where they took a, a novel control device. So you move a mouse around on a, on a screen, a mouse cursor, in this context, I need to say mouse cursor rather than real mice, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you, you move this device and in a way that you don't understand the mapping between your actions and what's going to happen on the screen. And at first, people move and then move their eyes to catch up. And but as over the process of learning how this control device works, 
what happens is the eyes start to go in time with and then ahead of the, the movements of the cursor. And at the end of the learning process, they learn they're about half a second ahead all of the time of where the cursor is. So it seems it does seem to be something that we need to learn. Then, if there are um, rapidly looming stimuli that you're not prepared for, I mean, from the side or something like that, do we actually look at those things? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so yes, um, I mean, it could be a threat. So you definitely you know, right. You need to. We do. It. We do. But there are there are task constraints on that as well, right? Because if it's looming, so <clears throat> one of the things that's often debated is like you know, is is motion an overriding signal that that kind of. Uh, overrides even these task things yeah. um but it, it's going to depend on the context because when you're walking down a street when you're walking down a pavement the fastest moving things and the biggest objects are the cars in the road but we don't spend a lot of time looking at them right except when we need to cross the road yeah. and so it's still about relevance to the task and it's still you know if if you detect an interception so if you detect someone walking towards you which you can do in peripheral vision then you start paying attention to them but if you're not detecting that your paths are likely to cross, then you don't, even though they're coming towards you, you don't spend that much time looking at them. So the answer is yes and no, yeah. depending on the situation. Yeah. I think you're very good though. Um, I was wondering how the eye movement would be fair when we are running. If first, if we would also look at the this event, we would look inside the event. Uh, or also if there would be other other movements and also um, which would, would be the difference in, in time between the movement and the actual changing yeah. phase. I, I think it depends. So when we're walking, so the, the example that I showed from Mike was a particular a particular task that people had where they had to like avoid stepping on the cracks in the pavement. So there was a good reason to pay attention. Um, but actually how much we look down and how far ahead we look depends on the terrain and how predictable it is. So if you, uh, so there's really nice work from Mary Hayhoe's lab, where if you get people walking on rough ground, obviously they look a lot more at the ground and a lot closer to their feet than if it's smooth ground. And similarly, Mike showed, you know, when you're going upstairs, for the first few steps, you look just ahead. But once you've figured out the height of the steps and, and that the, they're all the same, then you start looking much further ahead. And so you adapt, you adapt all the time, depending on how predictable the future is and the, and the ground that you're on. Um, uh, but you do use your head. The other thing then, do you look at the tangent points? I'm not sure, but you do use your head in anticipation of how you're going to turn your body. And it's one of the reasons that we can figure out how not to walk into people, because we know that's what other people do. Because as you, if you're about to turn, you move your head and your eyes first. And we use that as a cue to, to figure out, to negotiate with someone else where you're going to go so that you don't bump into each other. Very far from my area, but I'm wondering you, you showed us in, in Scott Michael uh, how, how it works for us, how, how vision and action uh, work together. But um, if you were to you know think of designing a system from scratch, like robotics, for example, would these be, you think, uh, a, a good set of principles to, to go about, or, or, or would there be other ways? Uh, and what we see is just the product of evolution. Yeah, I mean, a bit of both, actually. So I've, I've worked on a couple of projects with, with engineers trying to design a, an active vision system. And the solution for that is, or the solution that they kept trying to come to for that was completely different. So they, they really wanted uh, a camera above everything uh, and, and reaching systems from the side so that they could really map things in a very different way. Uh, and they wanted the whole task defined in different ways. So I think they're probably completely different solutions. And this is the solution that we're coming to because of the apparatus that we've been given in the first place. But the principle, I think the, the, the big thing, I, I should stop here. I think the key thing is that vision is there to serve action, not the other way around. But.